Hi everyone, I'm Sean Blackwell from BipolarAwakenings.com and today I'm going to be sharing with you a presentation called Innovations in Healing Bipolar Disorder. It talks about some of the work I've been doing since 2013, both on live retreats and online. So here we go. For those of you who don't know me, I've been at this for a while. My first video for YouTube was done in 2007 where I was asking people the question, okay, am I bipolar or waking up? I wanted to hear from people with bipolar disorder about the difference between what happened to me, which had really been a spiritual blessing, even though it got me put in the psychiatric hospital, and this thing that was getting people medicated for life. And then in 2011, I published my book, Am I Bipolar Waking Up?, which tells that story, which started in 1996 with my hospitalization and takes us up right until 2007. Question for you. First, do you think you've tried everything to heal your disorder? Okay. Think about that while we go through here. Little fact check. Please know it's not a matter of debate. There's no scientific evidence that bipolar disorder, depression, schizophrenia, or any mental illness in the DSM is genetic. Not a single person has been shown a medical exam proving the biological origins of their disorder. No PET scan, no MRI, no blood test, no urine test, nothing. And that's starting to come to the forefront now. Published last year was a meta study of meta studies around depression by Dr. Joanna Moncrief. And of course, so many people have heard about, you know, depression being caused by a chemical imbalance. And yet, what she found was that the main areas of serotonin research provide no consistent evidence of there being an association between serotonin and depression. It just doesn't hold water. It's a myth. We call it the chemical imbalance myth for people who are in the know. So that brings the question, if bipolar disorder is not caused by a chemical imbalance, what causes it? Well, from the research from Dr. John Reed and others, it seems like trauma is a big factor. In an interview he gave recently in Mad in America, child physical and sexual abuse are incredibly predictive of psychosis, however you measure it, much more so than any genetic factor. So we know trauma plays a big role in mental disorders, even though psychiatry doesn't really want to admit that. And that's great, but what is trauma exactly? Well, it's not just a bad thing that happens to you. It's part of a negative experience that you've not allowed yourself to feel, okay? As a result, it remains stuck in the unconscious, the unconscious part of your mind. But where is the unconscious? That's another question, right? Well, with the old paradigm, medicine looked at you as basically muscle, bones, fat, chemicals, all measurable things, right? And any mental disorder was to be found in the brain. The only problem is, as we mentioned, there's no scientific proof for any of that. Where are the mental disorders? Where's the trauma? Where's the unconscious? You can't find it in the brain. So we might need to look at a new paradigm. And this is what I call the transpersonal model. And as you can see with this artwork from Alex Gray, which is obviously is not an X-ray or an MRI, it's just an artist rendering of what appears to be going on with people. Like we have a bioenergetic system or a chakra system running through our entire bodies. The existence of this system cannot be proven scientifically because we can't measure it. It's a scientific assumption based on clinical experience. In this way, it's free of religious dogma. It doesn't really matter what your beliefs are, what your religion. The assumption is from transpersonal psychology that you've got this system, even if you're an atheist. Bipolar disorder and other related disorders are rooted in blockages in this bioenergetic system. Blockages are caused by emotional trauma occurring over the course of our lifetime. To heal bipolar disorder and other mental disorders, trauma must be released from these bioenergetic blockages. That's it. It's that simple. If you can release people's bioenergetic blockages that are rooted in trauma, you can heal the disorder. Okay, that's great. But how, right? How do we do that? Okay. Well, one way we can start to look at is holotropic breath work. It was created by Dr. Stanislav Grof, who's on your left, and Christina Grof in the 1970s. Holotropic means moving in the direction of wholeness, so it has an intention of healing. It may be used for deep healing or personal development, and basically they're both the same thing. All right. What's the process? Holotropic breath work combines accelerated breathing with evocative music in a special setting. And with the eyes closed and laying on a mat, each person in the room will use their own breath and in their own way and the music in the room to enter a non-ordinary state of consciousness, okay, a bit of an altered state. 
This state activates the individual's psyche, bringing the seeker a particular set of internal experiences, okay, that are coming up from the unconscious. Holotropic breathwork has the potential to release physical tension, kundalini energies, repressed emotions like sadness, anger, and rage, sexual repression, spiritual energies of a divine or demonic nature, and life trauma like uh, bullying, for example, or childhood trauma, but also adult trauma, a sudden death in the family or a car accident. You know, these can be traumatizing as well. Perinatal trauma can come up in holotropic breathwork as well. It's a big discovery of Stan Groff that a lot of the issues in our lives are actually rooted in our birth process. And that can come through when people work through their birth process again in a holotropic breathwork session. How does the healing take place, though? All right. Well, the healing agent is pretty woo-woo. The healing agent is this divine intelligence of a higher dimension. Stan Groff calls it the inner healer. I think it's God, basically. Could be angels, could be aliens, but I think it's God. The inner healer usually becomes activated when the mindset and setting are in proper order. So you just can't step into holotropic breathwork. You have to have a good orientation. You need to be mentally prepared to do this. And you need to be in the right space and you need to be with a trained facilitator, either from Groff Transpersonal Training, that's where I got my certification, or from Groff Legacy Training. You know, you have these experiences coming up related to spiritual energies, divine energies, or traumas. What do you do with these experiences? Well, the idea is that you express yourself. You make your inner healer fully present, and that can mean moving, like just moving around on the mat, laughing, crying, uh, you can vocalize, like singing. Some people start singing during their sessions. Swearing is quite common. And even if you sort of start to identify with an animal archetype, you could be howling like a wolf, making animal noises. All of this is perfectly fine during holotropic breath work. Okay. So now that I've described it a little, I'll give you a little bit of a taste of, of what it's like. Here's just a one minute clip. Here we go. People are breathing aggressively, but at their own rhythm. There's no specific breathing technique. They just go the way they want. They're moving to the music, all right? And sometimes the experiences that people have are very easy. They just might be you know, working through something, moving to the music, very nice and gentle. But then other times, involuntary tremors can come up, like this woman's tremors here would only come up in a normal state, right? Someone's working through an asthma condition. Here, this guy's in an extreme state called Tatani, where all the tensions come to the surface of the body. Sometimes body work is needed to help people work through those bioenergetic blockages. So there's a real tactile feeling for these things once you get into the non-nervary state that brings them up. Beautiful experiences can come up as well, like sexual experiences. And you can see it's very somatic. So it's very in the body, this whole thing. Sometimes your body wants to stretch moments of ecstasy, sometimes want, people want physical contact, and then we explain everything with mandalas in the end. Okay, They help integrate the experience and everybody survives in the end. So it looks like an exorcism, but it's actually a lot more gentle than that. So that's a glimpse at holotropic breath work, and that's great. It sounds great. It's very healing. The only trouble is that for people who have deeper disorders like bipolar disorder, it's often contraindicated because in a group setting with a limited time frame, it's considered not safe enough for somebody with a deeper disorder like bipolar disorder. But once I got into the work and started to do the research, I thought, well, what if we came at it in a bit of a different way? And so I created the Bipolar Awakenings Healing Retreat. That came up in 2013. I started running private retreats for people with bipolar disorder and depression. They were 7 to 12 days in length. The client would bring a volunteer supporter. And the client provided a private setting. So they didn't need to pay for a supporter. A lot of the times they could, you know, find a house on a budget and we could do this all for, for quite cheap. All right. Holotropic breathwork was modified to be bipolar breathwork. In order to give the technique more flexibility, I needed to be allow, allow people to stop whenever they wanted. The typical breathwork, holotropic breathwork was a three-hour session. Sometimes the bipolar breathwork was only going 20 minutes with certain clients. And we could breathe as often as they wanted, but they could stop whenever they wanted. And they also got my personalized attention. And we could even modify the music for them if they needed that. My first retreat was with Livia, Livia Tudor, in 2013. We had a very simple farmhouse in her home country of Romania. That's where we did the work, okay? 
And this is Livia today. You can um, you can see she's lost a lot of weight because she was able to reduce and eliminate, I think, for quite some time, a lot of her psychiatric medications, right? Now I've conducted over 50 private retreats with clients with bipolar disorder and other related disorders like depression and schizoaffective, and many of the clients have improved. Some have been able to reduce or eliminate their psychotic symptoms and their psychiatric medications and hospitalizations, of course. A couple of great examples are Kirsten Ogard in her article, Healing from Schizophrenia, which is in Madden America. She was hospitalized 11 times before she worked with me, and she hasn't been back to the psychiatric hospital since. And Monica Kettler as well. She was able to go off her psychiatric medications after her first retreat with me, which is a rare occurrence, but it does happen. And now she's working as a therapist. Her article, How I Healed My Bipolar Disorder, I think has over 80,000 views now. So it's really been something. And to have her working as a therapist now, doing work very similar to what I'm doing is, is a real achievement for her and for me because she was my client, right? Okay. Tim Canote was another client who's off his medications for five years now. Uh, he did a few retreats with me and, and Moni, actually. And the thing about Tim is he's really taken to media, not social media, but media media in the Netherlands, promoting the retreat process, the potential for healing from bipolar disorder. He's been on television and on the radio and in magazines all over the Netherlands talking about his healing process. So he's been a big help. And in that retreat process, we, we sort of went beyond Stan Groff a little bit because we made some discoveries. And the first is that the inner healer that I talked about is actually a healing field which can share the unconscious traumas of one person with empathetic supporters and facilitators. All right. So that was a big deal. And what that meant was that allowed myself and other retreat supporters to do deeper work on behalf of the client. See, what was happening on these retreats was that I was absorbing a lot of energies from people which were giving me a lot of nightmares. So if the process was full of anger, I would have nightmares full of anger. And halfway through a retreat, I would just be completely depleted energetically. You know, uh, And then when Monica Kettler started supporting a lot of retreats and working as a supporter, she was absorbing the energies as well. And so with Tim's retreat, I suggested that Moni breathe with Tim and see what would happen. And sure enough, she started to breathe through his material. And that was terrific because it meant that Tim didn't need to go through all the pain himself, right? Other people could share the pain with the person who's trying to heal. Pretty amazing. And we call that technique surrogate breath work, okay? A little bit like a surrogate mother breathing on behalf of somebody. And in our process, there were other discoveries we found that the healing field exists in the quantum dimension. There's no time and there's no space. And what that meant was that it gave me the capacity to do surrogate breathing at a distance for clients. All right. So I didn't have to be on retreat with people. I could actually help them heal, of course, at a fraction of the price from my own bedroom here in Brazil. Pretty amazing. And we call that process distance surrogate breathwork. So let's take a quick look at that. Basically, with distance surrogate breath work, it's a two-hour session for me, but the client lies on their bed for one hour. And then after my process, where I'm doing breath work in a similar way to what you've seen in that video, I leave a recorded message for them of any physical sensations, gestures, visions, or voices that may relate to my client. And then dreams may follow up the next two nights as well, all right? So instead of being on retreat and absorbing energies, I'm absorbing energies at a distance from people. And then I tell them the kind of content that was coming up for me. All right. The content that does come up, by the way, it's usually only three or four things in a two hour session. And the rest of the time, I'm just vocalizing negative energy and releasing a lot of physical tension. But there should be a few things that should relate to the client, either during the session or in the dreams afterwards. And just to give one example, I had a client whose husband died at only at the age of 40. You know, he was a very young guy. And um, so I wanted to do a little bit of work for her. She was still grieving, right? And I didn't have anything come up during my session. But at the end of the session, my hand was in this position. And I thought it might have been something demonic, meaning like bullshit or something, which I thought was like that. I didn't know what it meant, but I took a picture and I sent it to her. And she came back with this cup that her husband had bought for her. And it spelled love, L-O-V-E, on the cup. 
okay, in sign language. And so she told me that whenever she saw a hand in the position of my hand, she thought it meant something like I love you. And so I Googled I love you sign language, and this is what came up. The exact position my hand was in, and I had no idea, all right? So clearly this was a message from her deceased husband to her saying I love you from the other dimension through my body. It's a pretty amazing thing. By working with people through distant surrogate breathwork, I also found that some clients were reporting uncomfortable dreams and emotions surfacing on their side. And so I realized what was going on was that the healing field was taking material that was unconscious before and bringing it into their consciousness now that they were a little bit stronger from the work, right? So I decided to try having them use the same techniques of self-expression that I used during distant surrogate breath work, but without the over-breathing, because the over-breathing is what takes you into a non-ordinary state. It's not safe. But I found you could work with the conscious emotions. So the objective was to have them work with conscious emotions, not unconscious ones, right? And that we call conscious emotional clearing. Part of conscious emotional clearing, it had three different forms of self-expression, really. Primal vocalization, physical poses and safe physical movement. You're not hurting yourself. And then spontaneous uncensored talk. If you're having um, a particular issue with a person and they come into your mind, to talk to them as if they're right in front of you, but without censoring yourself. But one word on the pose is the, the physical movement. It's very similar to the breath work you saw. But the primal vocalization is quite unique because it's something that I found in my own work that long primal vocal tones, like if you're feeling sad, to express that through long tones, like, oh, or if you're angry, really helps to liberate that energy. And so with conscious emotional clearing, I've been recommending four training sessions for people to do with me because then we could take a look at each one of these practices uh, separately. Class one, primal vocalization. The next one, the physical poses, safe physical movement. Third, spontaneous uncensored talk. And then the fourth, we bring it all together. Right? And more discoveries along the way. We found that uh, distant surrogate breath work and conscious emotional clearing appear to be an ideal combination. They give the opportunity for us to build a stronger relationship because we work twice a week together, one day DSB, one day CEC. And the two techniques can play off of each other. All right. That means that if material comes up from the unconscious in the distant surrogate breath work, we can talk about it in the conscious emotional clearing session, which is actually a live video session. You know, we're on we're on a call and we can talk about that and then move into expressing that on the client side. I'm coaching the, the client how to do that. Right. And then finally, both techniques help to build client trust if people want to do a retreat. Retreat can be quite expensive, you know, I'll confess. And if a client can come down and I know them and then we can really hit the ground running on day one, we're going to get a lot more out of a 10-day retreat than if we have to build trust for three days. I hope you can see that, you know, there's been this gradual development since 2013, starting with the holotropic breathwork, which I was trained in by Groff Transpersonal Training, moving to bipolar breathwork because that's what was needed for my bipolar clients on retreat, having this incredible breakthrough in learning that people with empathy for the client can breathe on the client's behalf when the healing field sends them energy, that's surrogate breath work, finding that that can be done at a distance so that I could work with clients from my own home here. So this is our first online healing technique, distance surrogate breath work, and then realizing that I can actually coach the um, client to work through energies and emotions that they're conscious of conscious emotional clearing. So in a sense, DSB and CEC are two sides of the same coin. With distance surrogate breath work, I'm working on your unconscious emotion. And it's not a video call. It's just a what's up call. Hi, how are you? And then I go into a non-ordinary state and we do the work. So I'm working through your con unconscious emotions. With conscious emotional clearing, I'm training you how to work through your conscious emotions. So two sides of the same coin, me doing the unconscious, you doing the conscious. One of the great things about conscious emotional clearing is you don't need a therapist or a facilitator with you. You can do it with me as your trainer, sure. But then once you've got the training down, you can do it just whenever you're feeling triggered, particularly upset, something like that. Because what's going on is, okay, you're triggered by a particular situation. 
But the emotions that are coming up are not always or not entirely related to what you're being triggered by. It's coming up from the unconscious. It's surfacing. Okay, that's what's that's really what you're feeling. So then when you use conscious emotional clearing, not only are you working through the issue that's right in front of you, but you're clearing out your history. You're working through your childhood trauma. Okay. So back to that question. Do you think you've tried everything to heal your bipolar disorder? All right. Think about that. Uh, if not, if you want to get honest with yourself and realize, well, you really haven't tried everything, get in touch with me. I'm Sean Blackwell. I'm at BipolarAwakenings.com. We can book a consultation and start from there. Okay. Thanks for watching and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.